Hello and welcome to yet another instalment of our Nucleus Wealth Insight series. Just a quick reminder that the following presentation is general information only and does not take into account your personal circumstances. Whilst Nucleus Wealth aims to present informing and sometimes entertaining content, please consult your investment professional, financial advisor, or better yet, speak to us before making any decisions based on any of the themes discussed in today's presentation. Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. We have another special guest this week in Catherine Cashmore, who is a regular and highly respected commentator across local and international media. She is author of Speculative Vacancies, the only study in the world that analyzes long-term vacant housing based on water usage data. Working with Philip J. Anderson, an international leader on market cycles, Catherine is an expert on the real estate land cycle and its effects on regional markets around the world. On top of all this, Catherine is a sought after public speaker and president of the tax reform think tank, Prosper Australia, where she's called upon regularly to interact with policymakers and housing organisations to discuss real estate policy reform. In today's interview, we cover some of the key themes discussed by Catherine, who literally sits at the coalface of the Melbourne property market. After the interview, we'll then look at some of the wider investment implications that these themes can impact on how we invest money every day at Nucleus Wealth. So join Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Klassen, our Chief Economist, Leith Van Onselen, and myself, as we learn more about the intricacies of the Australian property market with Catherine Cashmore. I hope you enjoy. Today we are lucky to be joined by a real estate commentator, president of the tax reform think tank Prosper Australia, and co-owner of a property advocacy company called Anderson and Cashmore Real Estate. Catherine Cashmore, welcome to Nucleus Insights. Thank you. So um, I guess just to, to get the ball rolling and to uh, bring our, uh, our listeners up to speed, uh, how did you get into property, uh, and in particular becoming a, a buyer's advocate, and the, uh, of course the president of Prosper Australia? Mm. So I got into property when I moved to Australia, which was uh, 2003, and um, I started working as a sales agent, which is what most people do <laughs> sure. when they start working in property, and, and to be honest, I hated it. I did very well for a few years, and then um, it started to get me down. I wanted to move out of it. There was, there was, there was nothing really of substance within it to keep me to keep me intrigued and I met a buyer advocate when I was a sales agent okay and he said to me don't jump out come and try this side and so I did I started working in buyer advocacy and it was a whole different ball game because when you're working with buyers you start to analyze the market you need to know why what stimulates property what stimulates land prices to inflate how the market's affected and within that time, I started also to study economics and to do a lot of research on taxation policy in Australia. And I was doing a lot in the media. I was writing a lot of articles and doing bits and pieces on television. And somebody challenged me at one point to write an article on negative gearing. So I started to investigate. And up until that point, all the information about negative gearing had been what you guys hear in the mainstream media, which is that it... Um, you know, assists to keep rents low and it assists to increase the supply of investor property and that it's a good thing and that without negative gearing, our whole market, you know, would, wouldn't, wouldn't be good. We wouldn't have enough rental accommodation. Sure. And so when I did that article, I did a lot of research on it and I couldn't write an article like that. Mm. And I wrote an article saying the opposite and nobody in the property industry liked it. They didn't like what I was doing. Um, they didn't like what I was saying. And so I broke off and started to work on my own and got involved with Prosper, which was a fantastic organization, really proud to be a part of that. And um, I think to some extent, that's what's kept me interested in the property market. We do a lot of research on cycles, work with um, my business partner is uh, Philip Anderson, who's a market expert on cycles and, and um, how the economy works from that point of view, stock market and real estate. So it's interesting. Okay, yeah, sure. Well, thanks for that. Um, and I think we'll touch on some of the cycles and thoughts on cycles a little bit later on today. Um, just a quick one as well, I guess, for, for those that aren't, uh, that haven't got their, their nose in the macro business blog and haven't been following, do you want to just give us a quick uh, couple of minutes on, on Prosper, obviously, as president? Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the... Prosper Australia is a, it's actually the oldest Henry George club and Henry George League in the world. And it's now called Prosper Australia. It's about taxation reform. It's understanding that high land prices are really crippling to the economy. 
um, monopoly in land, monopoly in real estate, monopoly in natural resources, monopoly anywhere, whether it's the banking system or anywhere, is adverse to an economy, a thriving economy. And what we're trying to do is change the tax system, a big, broad-based change. Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to strip away speculation in the real estate market, create an affordable land market for everybody, prevent monopolies, natural monopolies, and free up work and productivity. And to, you can only do that by the tax system. The mm. tax system dictates people's behaviour. And uh, ultimately, what we're trying to do is remove taxes from income and productivity and put them onto land and natural resources. And understanding Australia, understanding the research that we have to do with that to present it to the politicians. We always present to every government inquiry. We do a lot of um, reports. Most people at Macro Business would know the re speculative vacancies report, which I write, which is based on water usage data. So we collect all the water usage for the whole of metropolitan Melbourne, greater metropolitan Melbourne, and we look at who is using an abnormally low amount of water over a 12-month period, and by that we can assess how many properties are vacant, hmm. which is always an interesting study to do because it shows how our market is skewed <laughs> towards investors, skewed towards greed and not necessarily need. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating and I'm really proud to be, fascinating organisation, I'm proud to be president of it. Um, and we've made significant inroads into changing policy mm. in Australia. Fantastic. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, we will jump into a couple of other questions. I know we've got, we've got Leith here who's... Uh, I guess from the macro business side and the, and the nucleus wealth uh, chief economist uh, is following the property market uh, quite closely. So uh, if you want to jump into a couple of questions for, for Catherine. Yeah, sure. G'day, Tim. G'day, Catherine. Uh, just a quick question. Look, uh, we at macro business, we spend a lot of time obviously analysing data and uh, looking at the, you know, the, 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 the broad data that comes out from you know, CoreLogic, ABS, etc. But we don't have a very good grasp of what's actually happened on the ground because uh, that, that's not reported. Um, I was just hoping to get some of your insights on what's happening in Melbourne, given that's where you work. And uh, according to CoreLogic, Melbourne's dwelling values have fallen about 3.5% so far this year. And CoreLogic shows that the bottom 25%, the most affordable end, has held up really well. Um, whereas the expensive end of the market, the, the end of the market, that's, that's basically been falling hardest. Um, is this what you're seeing on the ground? To a large extent, yes. So the Royal Commission has really hit the property market um, it's very hard to get an interest-only loan. There's a lot of buyers that I work with that had to drop out from buying because they can't borrow what they need to borrow in order to buy the accommodation that they want to buy, so they drop out. And because prices are falling, investors get nervous. So they don't know that with an investor, the, the way that they think is not that this is a great market to negotiate in, but let's just wait and see how far prices fall. And of course, they won't get back in until prices start to go up again. Um, in terms of where the market's gone, you've probably wiped around 12 months of capital growth of prices in some areas and six months in other areas. Good real estate still sells well. There'll still be competition around it. But when I'm in the market and I'm you know, dealing with negotiations, what you're left with in terms of vendors is the vendors that have to sell. Because no vendor will sell into a soft market if they don't need to. They'll try, and they'll try and get a price, and if they can't get that price, they'll withdraw their property from the market. So first of all, you have the vendors that need to sell, and they rush their homes onto the market because they can see prices are lowering, so they want to get rid of that stock. And then the price is lower to a certain level where it meets the market, and then you get competition around the listing. So there's been all sorts of situations that I've negotiate on, negotiated on this year. Um, one that comes to mind was a property... Uh, down the coast in Edith Vale, where the vendor had had a, an offer of uh, 1.05 million. That offer had fallen through, subject to finance, and after a long, drawn-out negotiation, we finally secured it for 955,000, and um, they'd done a renovation on it. They'd been advised by the agent to do a renovation. He thought that that would get them their price. They didn't get their price. They were so upset, they tore the for sale board down. Hmm. Um, with what they finally got. I think we negotiated it as the lowest price oh, for about six months within that market, six to 12 months within that market. So those are the types of, of opportunities that you get, you know, when you come to this market. And as a buyer advocate, it's, it's a great market to negotiate in. I mean, the interesting part of the job is negotiation. But in terms of the upper end, I mean, I've got clients that are over 3 million and I've been to a few auctions lately with uh, one of those clients to 3 million 
dollar plus properties. And one auction that we attended sold 500,000 above reserve. I said to him, let's not put down a prior offer because you know how many buyers, it's a, it's a slow market, how many buyers are gonna be above the 3 million level? I mean, it's, it's really hard to borrow that much. You've gotta have a significant amount in cash to be able to go and bid at that level. So we turned up at the auction and um, there was, uh, I think there were two Malaysian buyers that were bidding against each other um, in the end and it flew 500,000 above reserve. And that's not the only one. So it's, it really depends, really depends on you know, the property and the buyer. But generally the slump in the market has been caused by the Royal Commission. Yeah, mm. that, that's a beautiful segue to my next question. Um, as readers of Macro Business will know that Melbourne's gone through an incredible population boom. So the city's seen uh, a 250,000 increase in people over the past two years and a nearly 600,000 increase over the past five years. Um, do you think immigration and foreign buyers is driving Melbourne's housing market? Foreign money has driven Melbourne's housing market um, because we don't pick that, obviously we don't pick up what people bring in on our loan data. So talking to the mortgage brokers, I talk to a lot of mortgage brokers um, and they can confirm that. They have a lot of recent migrants that have come into the country and a lot of overseas buyers that want to buy. Um, and they would confirm that foreign money has been pouring into the market and also that accommodation is being left vacant. I spoke to one mortgage broker a couple of weeks ago who has a client that owns 38 properties north of the city. He's from Malaysia. And um, the majority of those properties are vacant. And, you know, w with the new migrants that come in, they don't come in, you know, they come in and obviously, uh, you know, a lot of them have left family overseas and they buy in family units. And so there's a lot of money that comes from overseas to a migrant that can afford, that can that is allowed to buy over here. And that can get, obviously has an inflationary effect on the market. Obviously it does. Yeah, and, and uh, just on that, uh, well, related to that, um, Australia is one of the few uh, places in the world where we don't have um, money laundering laws uh, with respect to real estate agents, accountants, lawyers, basically the real estate gatekeepers. Uh, do you think that's... That's a problem? Yeah, I do. Because we have no data for it either. It's very, it's very difficult to pick up to the extent of that problem. But I mean, I know within my own business, the amount of, I, I, have, I have quite a lot of foreign buyers that come to me and they want to find a way to buy in Australia. And they want to find a way to get their money over here. And part of, part of what I do is, you know, looking at the rules and, you know, working out how they can do it how they can do that I mean obviously legally <laughs> yeah. not illegally but um, you know that there, there's a there's an appetite out there and you know what what's actually going out on the ground isn't isn't transparent in terms of the foreign buyers um, so and, and talking about leaving properties vacant so so I'm assuming it's for a capital gains there they're looking for these types of things at, at what stage do you think um, that you know, how much of a fall do we need before we actually? It sounds very pro-cyclical. If, you, if you're out there buying these properties and I'm going to leave them, I'm going to leave them empty, and while the property market's rising, and then when the property market starts to fall and you get sort of five, ten, fifteen percent falls, is that enough to start shaking these out and actually people going, well, maybe I don't need thirty-eight, maybe I don't need less, or are these people you think just going to sit and hold it? This is a lifetime's work of just yeah, I'll just keep piling it on and buy another one every now and again. And nobody who's buying thinks mm. that the market is about to crash. Right. <laughs> that stands to so, reason. And there's no, there's no point in buying in Australia unless you're buying for capital growth. The only way you're going to get positive yield is if you're a developer and you do a few developments and you can usually get a positive yield plus a depreciation from a good development if you buy at the right price. Yep. But you can't get positive yields in Australia with what you buy. So you're, you're investing for capital gain or you're investing for a safe store of money. And most of the foreign investors that I deal with just see Australia as a safe market. They see it as a no-brainer. Because of our tax policies because of the population growth. Um, from what they see, the market's not gonna crash. And if you look at the medium house price, it doesn't. I mean, individual property prices, you can wipe 10% off an individual property price in a slumped market because your property is only worth what a buyer will pay mm. and what the bank will lend. That's the only thing that dictates what your property is worth. And if no one's there to buy it because either the bank won't lend or because they think the market's gonna crash, then you've wiped value out of your property. And I guess uh, it's probably probably not a good answer, but it's it's just trying to work out from our perspective is is there a stage where you sort of this turns into um, 
you know, get a fifteen percent fall, say, in property prices over the next little while, over the next year or two, and, and the Aussie dollar falls back, mm. you know, ten, fifteen percent as well, then all of a sudden international guys are sitting looking at, hey, I'm down twenty five percent, thirty percent on my my property. That's enough to shake it, saying, well, or, or it's more of just a little, it's I a, think it, it's a it's a it's a long term play on Australia. It'll eventually come good. It's so. it's a long term play. I mean, you the what what we're having at the moment is a clear of the carnage. So the people that have to sell, there'll be a flood of stock coming in in the spring. That's what the agents are saying. So they're getting a lot of market appraisals and a flood of stock coming on for spring. Once the vendors that have to sell have sold, then you'll get a tightening of stock. The only time you're going to get a property crash, a price crash, is when people have to sell. It's the only time. And the people that are selling at the moment, they're not selling necessarily because they're in financial stress. They're selling, a lot of people are out there selling because, you know, they, there's a, personal reason that they need to move or you know it's a percentage it's a percentage of the market that have to sell but not a large enough percentage of the market that have to sell to cause a property crash what causes the crash at the end of the cycle is uh is the private debt the amount of private debt that we've got increase in interest rates so you can't afford that debt the economy has been the, the productive sectors of the economy have been eroded away by so much money going into real estate and not enough money going into productivity. So people have to move further afield for work, productivity losses in the commute time. The shop owner that owns the shop at the bottom of the half empty apartment block goes out of business. You get an increase in homelessness. We can see all of that happening now. Ultimately, that's what causes the, the those productive... And, and unemployment. And unemployment. Well, unemployment <laughs> happens because of that, yeah. you know, because people go out of work, they can't live close to where they need to work and so yeah, on and so forth. They, they sell because they have to sell. Yeah, but I mean, when you get when the interest rates go up at the end of the cycle, which they do, if you remember in 2007, interest rates increased just about every time the RBA met, and I think they met what, at one point increased in 1%, and everybody gasped. And then at the end of 2007, the borrowing rates for property were around 9 to 10%. And I was bidding on property at that time, and I was working for a company, and I remember the boss of that company was very insightful, and he's, we hadn't seen a pass in all year. And every time we'd looked in the paper... At the results after the weekend, your jaw just dropped because the property next door to one that had sold last week would have gone 20 or 30 grand more. And I remember one vendor that bought a property in Bentley decided they didn't like it. One guy, not a vendor, sorry, buyer that had bought a property in Bentley decided they didn't like it, sold it too much, two months later, made back their stamp duty and <laughs> an increase. I mean, that was the t that's the type of speculation you get at the end of the cycle. And he said to me, uh, it was around, I don't know, November, December 2007, can't remember the exact date, you get ready for a passing because I reckon that last interest rate rise does it. And it mm. just does. And that's what breaks the market and because then you get a flood of stock that goes onto the market. Prices go underwater. When, when the property prices drop below the loaned funds in the bank, that's a financial crisis. And we we just have the we just have the fuel to throw at the fire to avoid that. But but two thousand and eight was not a good year for property. I lost my job in two thousand and eight working for that company because we buyers dropped out. Hmm. Um, Catherine, just a quick one. Um, there's obviously there's been a bit of talk about the interest rate or the, the fixed um or sorry the interest only cliff. Um, so have you uh, and, and this is I guess you know you read read a little bit about it, but it'd be refreshing to hear it from I guess from the the coalface potentially. But have you? Are you finding that that's uh, having any impact in in the way that investors are, you know, making it now or now making a decision essentially when they flick over to P and I can't afford it, and then hence there might be an impetus to sell. Usually, investors are prepared. Okay. So it's not it's not necessarily that I see that bringing on a significant crisis or anything. But what is happening within the lending sector is that um, if you need to borrow, particularly if you're borrowing to do a development. A lot more people going for low dot loans. If they can't borrow what they can, what they think they can borrow, then there's, they, they, get, they go into private lenders, and the private lender market is increasing, and the interest rates aren't overly high for private lending. You know, they're higher, but they're not high enough to prevent people moving to that side of the coin. So a lot of mortgage brokers are saying to me now, "Don't we, we're just not even going to bother with the banks. Mm. We're going to go to the private lenders now because the private lenders are taking the greater share of the market." You can speculate that once the Royal Commission has wound up in February, it might be extended, granted, but if it winds up in February, and give it a few months, let the memory go, the banks are going to start to try and get that market, that market, share, market back. share back. Yep. Because mortgage fraud, I know that that's what the Royal Commission is about, but mortgage fraud has existed since the tables were overturned in the temple. I mean, if you study the banking system, mortgage fraud is, is forever you know, mortgage fraud, fraud within the banking sector is is always there, you know, so the, the banks will start to loosen their lending policies as far as 
in my opinion, mm. that's what I, I, I think will happen. Okay, and, and on that note, I guess um, the obviously the Royal Commission, uh, a heavy, um, as we mentioned, uh, mortgage and, and, and banking focus um, in terms of lending. When this sort of plays out, do you think... Uh, but, what are your thoughts on the trustworthiness of, of these of these banks that have been put up in front? And do you think that there there's going to be a you know a, effectively? Uh, what, what well, I guess the best, better question is what what are they actually going to be able to do to restore trustworthiness in um, in the market and, and I guess for for the real estate <laughs> side of things. In terms of a of a borrower going in to the market, if they can't if the banks can't serve them, they'll go elsewhere to get the money. So, for example, to get a low doc loan, often what you need to get a low doc loan, you just need a letter from an accountant. And there are mortgage brokers out there that have a string of accountants that will write those letters to say that you earn X amount so that you can go and borrow X amount. Right. So if the banks aren't going to serve that sector, there's other places that will serve that sector. And the banks, historically, if you study the banking system, have always had... I don't know that there is trust. <laughs> I don't know that they are going to ever restore trust. I mean, who trusts the banking sector? I mean, I, I don't know that, that, that that's ever going to particularly happen. I, I think that, that they are tightening up. It's incredibly difficult to get a loan, and the, the rules are tightening. They're not, they're not coming down. Like, they change every day. Mm. Um, and it's really lowered significantly what people can borrow. And like I said earlier, to get an interest-only loan is very, very difficult now. To borrow in super is getting harder. Um, but there are way, you know, there are ways around it, even now. In, in terms of the funding behind these, I guess the shadow sector, um, so the non the non banking lenders, um, a certain amount of that's private money. If 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 the demand grows, where's the next set of? Do, do, I mean, are you across sort of that area of the market and where that where the money's coming from to to, to fund those? Super. Um, I don't particularly know exactly where the where the money is coming from, but there's a lot of people out there with a significant amount of money that are willing to about to lend for developments, for example. Mm. So a lot of my clients are small developers. Yep. We go and we buy land at a certain price, and we do the entire feasibility for it. So we buy the land, we work out what they you know what the end values are of the properties that they're going to construct, and. With development loans, the interest is capitalised on the end value. So, I mean, it, it used to be that you could go and buy a block of land. Say, you you know, to give you an example, there's a block of land that I negotiated in Aspendale for 1.4 million with 5% deposit on a 12-month settlement. So you go in, you pay your 5% deposit, which is 70 grand. You've got a 12-month settlement to do your plans and permits. The end value of that block is 4.5 million because we'll split it up and put three townhouses on it. The, the, the way that the loan system works typically with a construction loan is that they will lend you 65 to 70% of the end value of the project with the interest capitalised. So 65 to 70% of 4.5 million will not only cover the build, but it will be an overarching loan that can also cover the purchase of the land, the stamp duty, and the deposit that you've paid. That's how it, that's how it used to be. You mm. used to be able to go to a bank and do that. And so all the builder or all the, the, the investor would put down is the 70 grand. The rest would be a loan that is capitalized on the end value. And then you sell out at the end, you pay off the loan, and you walk away with whatever profit that you're walking away. And the profits, on, on, you know, the, the profits are significant, otherwise developers wouldn't do it. Mm. Now it's incredibly difficult to do that. It's, it's hard to get, you know, if anything, you have to take it on a short settlement because if you take it on a long settlement and they see that you're getting plans and permits on the land, they'll convert it to a construction loan and your interest rates will go up. So the, the, the way that the system is working now is, is affecting developments significantly, which means that construction will slow, which will put pressure on rents. Um, I can't remember what the initial question was as I kind of weeded <laughs> yeah, off into that story, well, but I guess it's to... to to kind of show you that, that what, what's happening with the private lenders now is that they are, there's pro because the banks won't lend on those developments like that, the private lenders have moved in and said, well, look, we're still secure that the market's not going to bottom out. You know, mm -hmm. that, so we'll lend you on the end value. You don't necessarily, the bank always wants to see that you've got the income to fund the development in, if, in case the builder goes broke or whatever over the course of the, the fund. And of course, the private lenders have now taken over that share yeah. of the market. And I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to work out how big that market is. And it's, I know it's hard to tell, but I guess it's it's whether you think the that market's starting to get tapped out in terms of, right... We've, not at all. No, no there's still lots of scope for Yeah, because to... there's people that approach me all the time saying that we've now got so many private lenders in our books that are willing to lend. I mean, they're, right. they're just taking advantage. 
of what what's happening in the banking sector. They're just it's a market. They're just picking up the market. But but obviously the 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 rates charged would be significantly higher than what was charged. Not previously. significantly. No, no. I mean, you can go to a private anywhere between seven to ten percent typically, hmm. and then more than that, depending on the risk. I mean, they assess each project individually. But, I mean, it's not necessarily much higher than the interest that you would pay. It's, it's not significantly higher. Yeah. Well, th- this is a great segue um, to my next question, which was th- th- there's been reports that Melbourne's lot prices have ballooned by about 30% over the past year, and that um, your typical that the median price of a Melbourne housing lot's about 360000 currently, which to me seems extraordinary. Um, and you know, there's obviously claims that, that it's a bubble. What, what do you think is driving this? And do you see it as a bubble yourself? And uh, is it primed to have a decent correction? Um, so they're two separate questions. So the, the thing that's driving it is, um, I mean, Melbourne has a permanent urban boundary around it, as you know. I mean, you've written enough about this. I feel like I'm preaching to somebody who's <laughs> going to know everything that I'm going to say. And within that boundary, most of that land has been purchased by large development companies that drip feed it onto the market in what they call stage releases to keep the price high. And it doesn't matter how much land the government rezones for development or for as residential or how many precinct structure plans they do, which I think they've pretty much done every one now. I think that they've covered that across, you know, within the, I mean, within the permanent urban boundary, it's huge, right? We can, it's not a population thing, but the government doesn't have control of the release of the land to the market. So the land price can't drop. Mm. Unless all that land was flooded, if all of that land was flooded onto the market, you would see a significant drop in price within the city because it would give people very affordable options on the outskirts. But uh, what they do now is they cut the blocks down to sort of 200, 300 square metres of land, build out to the boundary, these kind of cookie cutter new estates. And the houses within there, I've had a few clients that have um, purchased housing within there, they just turn over so quickly. They come on the market on Thursday and they're gone by Monday. So there's a migrant population, new migrant population that want to be homeowners and they move into those areas and they buy the stock high. But the developers are not going to flood the market with stock, so the prices are not going to reduce. They are going to with, with, withhold that supply and drip feed it onto the market within, within how they do it. Um, what was the other question that you... Yeah, I think you've oh, answered it. Do you oh, see I don't, a crash? Do you yeah. see it as a bubble? Like, there's no doubt that prices are, the prices don't have any fundamental supporting them. The only fundamental they support have supporting them is how much the bank is going to lend you. That's the only fundamental that prices have supporting them, subject to the tax system. I mean, if we had a higher land tax, the banks wouldn't lend so much because they'd know you have to pay a higher tax per year for the land. So, you know, they, they do take into account, if a mortgage broker is kosher, you know, they take into account what your income is and so on, you know, what your expenses are. They want to know all of those details. But the house is worth what the bank will lend. So the... the um, I mean, I study cycles and, and, you know, within the cycle research that we do, we adhere to the 18-year cycle, which I know that you've written about on macro business before. Um, we see that the economy is going to go through a significant slowdown in 2020 and how that's going to affect property prices is very difficult to assess. It's called the mid-cycle slowdown within that 18-year cycle. And the mid-cycle slowdown, sometimes it can hit property prices hard and other times you can just whisk through it. So the mid-cycle slowdown in the last cycle was 2001. It was the dot-com bubble. And if you remember the market at that point in Australia, it was still going gangbusters, and we didn't slow down until between 2003 to 2004. What's happening now, because we have such a significant slowdown in the market, is I expect that that could even give fuel for when the mid-cycle comes in and the Royal Commission's out of the way and the banks start to lend again. So even if we, what we're expecting at that point is, to, is a stock market panic. So even if there is some kind of panic within the stock market or some other area of the economy, it may not affect land prices as much as you think. But the point is, is you have to you have to plan for these things. But uh, so I mean, I see. Sure, I see the market as a as a as a bubble. But in terms of do I see a significant drop in prices anytime soon? 2020 could be a bad year, but I still expect the end of that cycle and the significant drop to be at the end of the 18 year. There's different theories within that. Though, I mean, with the, with the 18 year cycle, there was a time, because it really comes from America. So it's been every 18 years since America started to sell its land publicly in 1800, apart from the two world wars, which broke that cycle. And also the, the development of the car. There's, there's regional things that can break it as well. Um, 
And England and America have always been set on that cycle and we, we kind of follow them. But at one point, England and America were out of sync. So when England was going through a mid-cycle, America was going through a significant, you know, the end of the 18 year and vice versa um, before they became synchronized. We do have a more of a synchronized market now, but you know, you can, spec you can speculate that because Australia hasn't had a significant recession for so long, that any recession that we could get in 2020 could be more significant than we're perhaps expecting. But if you adhere to that 18 year cycle, then you would be expecting a peak in prices in 2026 and then a downturn 27, 28, 29 into 2030. Okay. Probably, yeah. Yes, that's probably a good time to flip some into the investment side. So more into uh, yeah, how how we how we look at these things and, and, and how they can affect sort of what we're doing in terms of in terms of stock buying. One of the key ones I look at um, or I guess going forward is this sort of this something you touched on before this renovations part in terms of um, you know a strong property market often also drives a strong renovations market and sort of you know and then it's, it's looking for these counter cyclical plays. And whether you're speaking about um, you know, people not, not getting the returns now on the renovations in you know, in, a, in a rising property market, you know, you do a renovation and, and your, your land price goes up by fifty grand, and, and then you make back your renovation, and you, you think how well you've done on your renovation. Whereas, um, you know, a lot of it was just that embedded land price. And so now the question is, you know, is that starting to reverse? Like, are we starting to see people holding back on the renovations? In um, some of the stats sort of showing that, but I guess, mm -hmm. in, is it because they're, they're lacking the finance or is it because they're starting to lack the desire to, to, to do the renovations? The, the renovations, if they're doing it to sell, mm -hmm. usually comes from the advice of the agent. So yep. the agent, you'll, you'll get a couple of agents through for market appraisals and they'll let you know, judging on their local knowledge, what you should do. Mm -hmm. In the situation that I was talking about, you know, the agent really felt that if that buyer did, you know, put in a new kitchen, bathroom, carpets, blinds, mm -hmm. and spent, you know, 30 grand, on doing a renovation that they were going to get it back in the sale price and of course they didn't mm. um it, would, you know i mean that the, the, it depends it re, truly depends on what you're selling to be honest whether you're going to get that money back in the renovation but but i guess so so what you're saying though is a, it's comes a lot of it comes from the agents and so in in your view the agents still um you know generally recommending yes go and do some renovations as opposed to no no just get rid of this as fast it, as you it, can it, yeah soft. i mean if in an agent with that particular one in edith vale it was on a significant sized block of land mm. that we could put three townhouses on and there was a council laneway at the side that we could buy so it was three you know separately titled townhouses that, that we could put on it yeah. the the renovation wasn't going to do anything it was going to cut the developer market out mm. so it depends who you're who you're selling to i mean the, the agent with that felt that they would get a home buyer if they renovated the house, they'd get a couple of first home buyers that wanted to be in that area and that would pay another 50 grand extra because they'd put a 30 grand renovation in, say. Yeah. And of course, he didn't get that. I mean, it, the only thing, if you look at, at where the, the most capital gains that you'll ever get in a market, in, in a Melbourne market, are on unbroken 600 plus or development size blocks of land mm. that you can subdivide, right? The value of the land is in the zoning. Mm. And the only thing that is disappearing in supply in Melbourne are those 600 standard size blocks of lands, blocks of land that you can subdivide. When I say the value is in the zoning, you can buy the smallest block of land in the city that you can build the skinniest skyscraper on, <laughs> and it's going to be a better investment for you than buying a larger block of land a couple of streets down that will only allow you to put a couple of townhouses on. Mm. The value is in what you can actually do to the land and the overlays that you've got on it. But if you take a bird's eye view of Melbourne, what you can see is the land on the outskirts, as we just discussed, is being cut down into 200, 300 square meter blocks. The only place that you will get those unbroken blocks is generally in the middle ring suburbs. Mm. And so those suburbs that are close to the city, when you take a bird's eye view, you can see them increasingly being subdivided into two, three, four, and five blocks of townhouses as high a density as they can do because Melbourne was rezoned mm -hmm. three years ago or so. Um, and that means that if you own an unbroken block of land <laughs> within one, you know, within Cooey of a good school, you know, reasonable shopping strip and a train station or whatever, you've got all those facilities around you, you're owning something that is decreasing in supply. And that means that there is pressure for the price to go up. Now, what that land will sell for depends on market conditions as well. So in this market, it, at the beginning of the cycle, when land prices are a bit lower and a developer can make a good margin on it, then the developers will fight for the land. But in, what happens as the cycle goes on and the land prices increase, you know, it's more as a speculative buy. Somebody will buy it and hold it, expecting the price to increase, or it will be a home buyer that will buy it and outbid a developer. 
just depends. Yeah, yeah I've just got a, I've, I've got a pretty good uh, anecdote of that. Uh, I live in Ashburton. That's got those sorts of sorts of blocks, and pretty much every single house that's sold, apart from the ones that've been fully renovated, have sold to developers that've been knocked down and built townhouses. Uh, but what I've noticed in the last year is a lot of these houses have basically uh, haven't been developed. And uh, there's there's a house directly across the road, and I had a had a planning permit out the front about eighteen months ago, and it's still sitting there vacant. They're just um, they're not renovating it; they've just got some short term renters in. But that's starting to happen in my area. So there's there could be two reasons for that. Um, first of all, supply does it does affect price? Even though we do that study at Prosper, where we can tell you that you know, uh, and we work very closely with the SRO because obviously that study helped bring in the vacancy tax. This is the speculative vacancy study on water usage um, inspired the vacancy tax and we've done a lot of work with them and they also, you know, they they work, they do their analysis of the vacancy tax on, on water usage. But when we did that last study and we've just collected the data for the next one, you know, we, we speculated that there was around 80,000 plus properties that were vacant in Melbourne. So obviously it, if all of that supply was utilised on the market, it would bring down prices. If all of that supply flooded the market, either in rental accommodation or it properties for sale it would bring down prices um, despite anything else if you rezone Melbourne if someone buys a block of land to develop it you want them to develop it not just sit on an empty house All right so that's one thing but a lot of the reason that these houses are staying empty for longer is because the planning process is so constipated you can put in plans and permits for townhouses and 18 months later still be waiting for the approval because someone at council has gone on maternity leave or they've gone on holiday <laughs> or you know it's going to be next week it's going to be next week and the more you hassle them the more irritated they get so it takes longer to get planning approval in melbourne and house by house it changes some you'll get it within six months and some you'll have to wait that 18 months but it takes longer to get that approval than it does to build a house and those types of things that go on in the in the micro <laughs> you know that go on in a micro affect what's happening macro so it could be that the developer intended to develop, but he hasn't got planning approval. It could be that he intended to develop, but he can't get the finance to develop because both of those things are affecting the developers. The developers are not our enemies. The small developers are genuinely buying blocks, not speculating on the increase in land price, but they're buying box, blocks to do an immediate development based on the end prices in today's market to make their margins, to make a profit and to go on. That's how they make their money. And you know, we need that demographic in the market to help increase supply. Mm. In, in, the, um, in the work you've done on cycles, do you, do you do much on in terms of multiplier effects in terms of property versus, say, mining and, and things like that? Um, those? No, not, really not massively. What we, what we notice is the property cycle pretty much sits underneath all cycles. I mean, land, we, we need land for everything. Everything that's around us is made from land. Mm. So land is the most important commodity that we have. Food, water, work, play, shelter, accommodation. That land cycle sitting underneath every other cycle and because the banks lend predominantly against land, it, you talk to anybody, I spoke to somebody last night who had gone to a bank to try and get a business loan and couldn't get one based on a very, very good business model that had a solid history because he didn't own a block of land, he didn't own that collateral for the bank to lend against, so to get that kind of lending is very hard and I think in the studies that have been done, you know, only 10% is lent for venture capital, the mm. rest is, is lent against land as collateral. So the land market is a significant is a significant balance to whatever helps on top, and it, it adds volatility to the cycle. So what we do is we look at what's happening with that cycle, and then with that knowledge, we analyse what's going on in the stock market and on the Dow and on the ASX and um, individual stocks, and then we advise. My business partner takes this side of the business, but then advises um, traders and of what to invest in. Um, knowing where the minor recessions and when the major recessions are going to fall and also noticing what's going on within the land market that might cause a regional variation within that cycle. And, and in terms of the cycle, the, the drought, does drought have much of a, an impact on, of course, on that? Yep. Of course, yeah. Um, so if I was going to, so actually maybe, maybe I'll, I'll split it another way. If I sort of split sort of five factors out for you in terms of um, availability of debt, um, in, in terms of what's driving a, a property mm -hmm. cycle in terms of price, so availability of debt, um, population growth, uh, tax benefits, um, supply constraints, and, and drought. Mm. If you were going to rank those as your, from the most important to the least important. Availability of debt. You don't need population one? growth to push the market. You just need money. Yeah. You need wage growth, potentially. I mean, if you analyze areas based on the wage growth within the area, then you, that will usually, 
it indicates gentrification, you can look at those things. But the, the availability of debt is really important to the price of the property. You don't need population growth, you just need speculation. You need an economy that is bent towards speculation, which is what Australia has. The well, economy dictates how you invest. Although I would disagree on one point there, obviously, uh, pretty in, uh, in Melbourne's case, over 100,000 people per year means more bidders. It also means more people going to the bank asking for a mortgage. So, so generally speaking, more people means more debt. Yeah, yeah okay. So, so from your perspective then, as I said, a lot of this hangs down to the, the, the post-Royal Commission, whether if things t- loosen up a bit, mm-hmm. then well, you can be off to the races mm-hmm. again. But if... Um, if, if there's a bunch of, um, if coming out of the Royal Commission, there are recommendations that then get picked up, which are uh, uh, quite strict and, and, and don't don't allow that, then, then there's obviously more downside than... Yeah. There's more downside until those rules get loosened again. Hmm. And because, you know, because our economy, unfortunately, the nation has been breastfed on the notion that the way to get wealthy was through property investment. <laughs> I mean, uh, the whole tax system is bent towards it. Yeah. And so our economy is based on it. So you can speculate <laughs> that the politicians aren't going to particularly want property prices to drop significantly. Mm. If they do, they have to change the structure of, of the tax system and the economy, and they have to start looking for other areas yeah. where the money can come in. And so, and so that, I mean, that's why obviously one thing we're looking at as well is what's the most what's the most obvious one? I guess say so Scott Morrison's got nine months or so to run. Um, what are the most obvious things he could do in, in that? You know, if property prices keep sliding, and, and he's worried about labour coming in and changing things. What, what are the things he could do to property? There's a mass of things that he could do to property, which is what Kevin Rudd did in 2008 yep. to property yep. to inflate. The, I mean, all you need to do is allow foreigners to buy established property. That's yeah. that's number one first for inflating right. the market. You, yeah, first first home buyer grants, removing stamp duty for first home buyers, which is what we have now. You know, yep. zero stamp duty below six hundred thousand. I mean, there's so much fuel that you can throw at the fire. There's two things. It's not you don't need a silver bullet to create affordable housing. You can create affordable housing tomorrow mm. with policy change. But the reason that the politicians won't do it, and I've said this, <laughs> we we were invited to a round table in Sydney to talk to um, uh, Craig Emerson about switching from stamp duty to land tax in mm. New South Wales. And we were there with the Property Council, Farmers Party, a few other economists, I think, I don't know whether the Grattan were, were there as well. Um, but we all went into this room, room, were told it was off the record. And the first thing was that became evident was nobody disagreed that it was a no-brainer. Mm. It's economically far more sensible to have a broad-based land tax than it is to have stamp duty. I won't go into the reasons because the leaf has written about it a billion times. Yep. The conversation was not that. The conversation was how do we do it and stay in government? Mm. The politicians know they have a short term in government and they have a nation that has been breastfed on that notion mm. of rising property speculation. And not only that, but they also have to deal with the transition. A whole heap of people that have bent their investments and, and how they're going to survive in old age mm. based on their the home price, the investments that they've done, the developments that they've done, however they've done it. So the, the conversation then just wheeled around how the hell do we do this? And the only way that you do it is from the ground up. You have to re-educate the population. And you can re-educate them with small changes in the tax system because that changes behaviour. But if they don't like those changes that you're doing because it's taking away the value of their property price, they're not going to vote for you in the next election. Yep. So that's a that's not a great move for a politician and, and politicians are, you know across the west have had that same problem it's the same in England except in Germany where it's a uh, you know only you got a 35 percent home ownership rate and most people rent on secure contracts uh, over there the renters have the political power and they're looked after that that's true in Germany although after 2000 a lot of money flooded in 2008 but the rental rules are very different than they are here yeah. I mean in Germany you take the kitchen with you you know you rent a house and you basically have to have to put a kitchen in and put a bathroom in. So it's a very different mentality to what we have here. And of course, a lot of that was the history of Germany after the, the post-war reforms and and that encouraged the nation towards manufacturing and not towards property speculation. Uh, Catherine, I was just going to say, so we've touched on before um, the um, this policy and, and you know the impact that it's just almost certainly going to need to have to, to do anything <laughs> going forward. Um, obviously, we've got Labor's uh, planned negative gearing coming up. Is is it actually going to? Do you think it's going to take root and fruit? Given that you know, with a you know potential what fifteen twenty percent pullback in house prices, obviously the opposition now can just wave a flag and say, well, you know, does anyone want to fan the flames? 
the <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, the market's already in a slump. We've already wiped the value of the property prices, and there's already screaming that's going on about that. You know, within the large lobbyists, which are property yep. people. So for Labour to come in and do that, um, it, the the negative gearing plus the capital gains reforms, and also if they do anything with land tax and stamp duty, will have a significant effect on property prices. And they will be lobbied very strongly not to do that. And whether they can do that at the beginning of their term and then see it out for the entire time without backflipping remains to be seen. And I think there's a lot of us that are sceptical that that's going to happen. Yeah, well, I, I guess one thing in their favour is that the Greens strongly support uh, these reforms. So at least Labor won't have any political roadblocks uh, in terms of getting it through the Senate. Um, just on, on the negative gearing and capital gains tax thing, there's there's been various estimates about its uh, impact on prices. For example, the Grattan Institute is a little bit diluted in my view, uh, thinks that uh, it'll only reduce prices by about 1% to 2%. About others um, said about 10%. Uh, macro businesses' views have been, you know, we're, we're just guessing, but probably a 10% uh, price increase, a uh, 10% uh, price reduction. What's your view um, of the impact of Labor's policy? I think it's really hard to assess. Oh, the course, ne yeah. negative gearing on its own wouldn't have a massive impact because there's a lot of people out there that, that aren't negative geared. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that it could easily lower. If they if they got in and did that, particularly as, as we see in the economic cycle, the economy going into a slump in 2020, then I think those policies could have a really significant effect on property prices and potentially cause prices to go, you know, to push us more towards a financial situate crisis. <laughs> well, it's a big headline. <laughs> but, um, and, and, and uh, my, 10%, you know. Yeah, my, my view is it'll have a bigger impact in Sydney and Melbourne just because Sydney's, um, Sydney, more than half of all loans are investor loans. If you exclude refinances in Melbourne, it's about, it's over 40%. So. Those, those two markets, at least on the face of it, seem to be most uh, most at risk. If you look at the median price drop over all the cycles, over all, all the falls, it's, it's never gone more than 10%. I think it did in 1991, just. Melbourne and Sydney, over the course of the cycle, historically, have had the largest capital gains of any other cities in Australia. And I see Mel Melbourne really being as a bellwether state because as Sydney peaks early in the cycle, because it gets unaffordable, it starts to lose on interstate migration, and then we start to pick it up because we're a more diversified market. And diversified city and we just have you know geographically so you know I mean the there's potential in there for all sorts of things to happen but to hit Melbourne and Sydney pretty hard yep. um, stretching across into uh, the the other sort of commercial property markets um, if you see a, a significant pullback in in residential do you, do you expect that to flow through to um, you know, I guess on a on a supply, it's, it's, it's almost you, you sort of almost argue the supply should be the other way around, but it's you know obviously the economy is probably going to be headed in the same direction. The commercial market is almost a better indicator of what's happening in the economy broadly, mm -hmm. because it's tied to business, and the yields in commercial, well in Melbourne, you know they're they're not great, <laughs> and the prices aren't going anywhere. You know, it's not an investment that you take. So I mean, for sure, it's going to hit the commercial sector as well. Getting vacancy rates and that kind of data within commercial is very difficult. It's far more difficult than the residential. There's a lot more data to go on with the residential than there is in commercial. Um, yeah. and, and so on the ground, do you, do you see any of the, what's happening in sort of, I guess, small retail, small um, sort it's of factory It's going nowhere. Type? Yep. It's going nowhere. And there's a lot of vacancies as well, particularly within the retail sector. Mm. Because, you know, again, to do with the broader economy, you've eroded that sector. I mean, that sector is up against it anyway with internet, shopping and internet you know, with, with what's happening globally. Mm. And so when you hit it with a heap of taxes, I mean, you've got GST, payroll tax, income taxes, which are going to hit it even further and, and reduce its competitive base. And then you've got high land prices. So employees that need a wage to be able to afford land to live next to the retail sector, it doesn't stand It doesn't stand a chance. It's going to be, that's that's where, you know, when we talk about the, the tax system, it's, it's the hardest thing to measure within the tax system are the dead weight losses that come from, that productive taxation. And if you look at the studies, how it affects land use can't be measured. So you can run a bookstore out of business because it can't compete in a world economy of Kindle and employ the 20 staff and pay all the taxes on top of that that it needs to pay and the rents of the land. 
it'll run out of business and be sold to a gas station, which is limited in supply and only needs to employ three staff. And you've changed the land use and you've changed the amount of employees and you know, you've know you caused extra unemployment. It erodes those sectors away. But in the studies that have been done, for every dollar of taxation that you collect on income tax, you lose $2 into the economy. You might as well throw your taxes down the drain, let alone the, the what people are starting to understand that you know whether tax actually funds anything anyway. But... And that's another argument that macro business, you know, writers and commentators will have a lot to say on. But the the um, yeah, I mean, those those types of businesses are really up against it in Australia. It's not a great economy for them to survive in. Okay, very good. Well, look, uh, on that note, I think we're coming pretty close to time. So um, with no more questions, thank you very much for sharing your insights You're today, welcome. Catherine. And uh, it's been a, a real pleasure and we wish to have you back on the uh, on the podcast soon. We'd so, love to. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Cheers. Thanks. So, Damien, uh, that was a pretty fantastic interview. A lot of insight there from, uh, from Catherine. Uh, Broad range of topics, uh, uh, some interesting uh, I guess, views on uh, the, the state of the Australian property and, and how it's going to be affected going forward. Um, I thought we might take some time now, though, to, to look at, I guess, uh, what we do every day, investing money with Nucleus Wealth. Um, and uh, I guess we'll, we could probably kick it off with the fact that, that Catherine uh, had a, had a two-year like viewpoint on, uh, on markets in and uh, how did you think that, that sort of reflected in what we're doing? Yeah, so, so she's sort of looking for an end of the cycle um, you know, in 2020, I think. Um, that's probably not dissimilar to where to, to our thoughts. I think uh, there's obviously a lot that goes into that where we think there's a, a scope for markets to, to fall earlier. Uh, um, I think there, a lot of that's so dependent upon what's happening in the US, which is the, the real um, you know, engine for global growth at the moment. So uh, I think there's, there's sort of a couple of different scenarios we can see um, coming out of it. But, but one scenario is that uh, Trump doesn't get a, 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 a sorry loses his majority in one of the, the House or the Senate, and that um, they then look to try and put through a, a big infrastructure spend, which we, we think would be relatively well supported by the Democrats. And he did run run on that, and that would sort of extend this. Um, you know, that could add another year to the uh, to the to the life cycle. Of, um, we could also see uh, if if the US and uh, China got in a a, a more uh, heated trade war that both both those countries could also be spending quite quite big in terms of um, you know, they could they could both have infrastructure spends to, to keep their economies going while um, to, to make sure they're not damaged too much by the by the trade war. Uh, on the flip side, you know there, there are a whole host of different things that could see uh, the cycle come to an end uh, earlier. Uh, emerging markets is probably the one of the key ones. So there's both seen a, some ructions already in in Argentina and in uh, in Turkey, and that could certainly spread. Um, so I guess what we're looking at is, um, you know, somewhere in that um, in that next sort of eighteen months, um, and, and dependent upon a few of those factors. But um, so I guess I guess we're relatively similar in thinking. I think in terms of the Australian property market, though, we're, we're probably a little bit more negative in the in the short term. I think where whereas I think um, Catherine's view was it would sort of hold up for a while until we sort of hit this next economic shock. Mm. I think we're more of the view that it's going to be sliding and that it could actually be a, uh, um, we could actually see uh, external events sort of put that a little bit of extra pressure on the Australian housing market and, and, and it come off a little bit earlier than, than say world markets. So, so essentially uh, the, the, the Australian property uh, market is creating an internal bit of pressure and then it's then it's going to be very susceptible to an external shock or, or something that, that, yeah. that, that accelerates it. Yeah, that's right. So I guess I guess what we and, and I think Catherine would certainly agree with us that the, that it's vulnerable. It's in a vulnerable position. There's so much debt behind it. There's been they had a hum, number of positives for it. We could see, um, and we probably will see some some government um, throwing. You know, we spoke about whether it be um, more first home a federal first home buyers grant or whether it be letting people raid their superannuation account and. And, and things like that, or, or not bringing in uh, negative gearing reform, perhaps. As That's well. right. Yeah, yeah, not bringing, uh, or um, you know, there could be other things in terms of backstopping. Um, the government could, could look to try and backstop some of the uh, some of the residential mortgages in order to, to, to get more debt out there for people. But but in the end, these are all stopgap measures, and, and so um, and and if they come, they need to make sure they come. They don't come too late because it once once a property market starts to um, starts to fall and fall quite quickly. Um, I think you'll see a change will we'll flip around from whereas people are looking at it now, this might be my last chance to ever get in. And then if the market, the market fell 10%, they might be saying, well, let me just wait and see where it settles first. 
And it does sort of seem to me like, um, and obviously prices are set on the margin, that um, in the retail, which is effectively you know residential property market, you've got the investors and you've got homeowners. So the investors are, have got the ability to lose confidence mm. and then be a big you know detractor on on the on the marginal price. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. but I think that it applies to most. Um, I don't think that it applies to the first home buyers as well, which which is where I guess. Um, the, the th- our thoughts are that they're going to be asked to take one for the team. It's sort of like bring forward your purchase, and, and we'll give you some some uh, first home buyer, buyer grants that make it look make it seem like it, you're getting a good deal, but but, but you're not. Mm. Um, and so the question is though, if if you're seeing um, some real big price falls in the market, and and the mentality flips around from um, hey, this is your last opportunity to have a buy to wow, this might be a bit of a an extended downturn. Mm. Then you can see people sort of step away and, and wait to wait to see where the dust settles before they buy. Okay. And so yeah, so so that's sort of that. I guess that side of the market. So where, and what does that mean for investment? Um, the actual stocks we're out buying is probably the the key question then. And for my part, um, you know, the thoughts around that that Catherine have, as I said, sort of fit with ours. I, I guess if you were, if you were more um, if you're taking her view that the the housing market. Was only was going to basically tread water until the next crisis. Then you've probably got scope to still be looking at, um, say, some of the banks or, or, or retailers or, or um, even some of the residential. Uh, sorry, not the residential. The, the real estate investment trusts. Mm. Um, I think where you'd still have to be quite cautious though if you're going to take her view on that. And um, so you'd have to be certainly looking and saying, well, uh, I'm in these, but but if things turn um, sooner, then then you need to be getting out quite quickly. We're um, of the view that, that it is too dangerous in, to, be, to be overweight any of these. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, we're looking underweight in, in most of those. So, so banks, uh, well, it's pretty hard to find stocks in Australia that aren't exposed to the, the property market. <laughs> the Absolutely. most obvious ones are, are, are your REITs. Um, having said that, you know, there, are some, there are a number of REITs that are listed that have got international exposures, which sort of lessens that a bit. Uh, in terms of the banking side, you're um, you're looking at the banks in terms of saying, well, what's the fallout going to be? And there's a what, what I'd like to call what a what sorry not not I like to call I guess what what people call the widowmaker trade, which is um, shorting Australian banks. And, and um, this is overseas. Like there's plenty of people overseas who are very keen to short Australian banks because they don't think uh, the Australian housing market is sustainable, and they do think it's in a bubble. Um, the only thing is the banks have such a high yield that it's a, um, and they've been great performers over the last sort of four or five years that every time the, um, the hedge funds have put that trade on, uh, they've, they've lost money. Mm. Almost mm. Most times they've lost money. The last year's been obviously a lot better for them. But um, so the question with that is, um, it's a very costly trade because of the high dividend yield. And so, um, yeah, so the, so the thing for the banks is making sure that um, uh, for, the, for those yeah, make sure that you don't you don't get in too late when those hedge funds all start piling on back onto that trade again. Okay, and I guess um, probably one of the other sides of um, the the investment market or the property investment market is then filling your house with things once you've bought a house. So where do you yeah. see retailers uh, headed? Yeah, so any, anyone sort of in the Harvey Norman type um, type bracket where um, you're reliant upon furniture and, and, and things like that um, is going is going to be doing it tough as well. So as you, as you said, it's sort of one of those things where um, when you take a step back, sort of logically, it doesn't make as much sense to, to you say, well, you've just shot out a fortune on a new house. Why don't you fill it with brand new furniture as well? Mm. But but the reality is that's what people do. Mm. And when they're not buy, out buying new houses, they make do with the furniture they've got. And you know, every now and again, they'll replace something. But but the big, the real big impetus for a lot of those um, sort of retailers is a, um, a, a, a new purchase. Then you've got to fill it with new furniture. The other thing is... Um, uh, the other one is the the, the Bunnings type uh, one. We, talk, we spoke a little bit about that, uh, the, like the renovation, the renovation side. Yep. Yeah. So I'm still, um, I'm very much trying to. You can probably tell from the line of questioning was I'm trying to get a feel for, for what's happening in that market. I think it's uh, it still seems to be all right. Um, I do think that's going to be an area that's re- that it really will turn down. I think there's when when people have got. Um, and, and, and given there's, um, it's much harder to get money out of your, your mortgage now. I think when when people have got, turn around the house, they go, "Wow, well, I just made a hundred thousand dollars on my house last year from from doing nothing because property values went up. Maybe I can draw down fifty thousand of that and put on the new pool or the new, you know, yeah, kitchen, bathroom, or, bathroom or something exactly. like that." Yep. And so, whereas when um, when you you're sitting on a loss, when you've lost a hundred thousand dollars on your same property, um, 
first of all, you don't have the, the debt to, to draw down on, but also you're much less likely to, to want to pour more money into your property yep. um, if, if prices are falling. So, so that area of the market, and there's a whole bunch of stocks that sort of flow on from that, um, you know, building material stocks and, and, and things like that, that all sort of uh, fall under that same, um, that same category. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, look, uh, on that note, we might hear some more about uh, how to invest with Nicholas Wealth. Nucleus Wealth and the Macro Business Fund was put together to help give you access to quality, well-researched stock analysis and superior macroeconomically minded asset allocation. We use technology to help us provide a service typically only available to high net worth and sophisticated investors at a fee level that rivals the more basic solutions available to these everyday investors. We do this by using separately managed accounts which allows clients to enjoy unparalleled transparency in what they own and why. It also means that each client effectively owns their own separate and discrete share portfolio, which is managed by us. We have partnered with Linear Asset Management, who are backed by the ANZ Bank for Cash Management, and JP Morgan, one of the biggest banks in the world, as custodian of your assets. We feel that this structure is the gold standard for your financial protection. In addition to this, we offer 19 separate and individual ethical screens that you can use to help tailor your investment. To ensure that your money is not being used to support companies that deal in areas and practices that you feel are important. By eliminating the areas that are only important to you, you keep the potential for higher returning areas that you might otherwise be ambivalent about. And these would typically be ruled out in broader ethical products currently available in the market. The name Nucleus comes from our ability to provide the core holdings of a client's portfolio, allowing them the time to explore areas that may be of interest or they may have experience in. We also offer a complete investment solution for those who don't have time to coordinate their own investments. Our investment team has decades of experience in world markets and we have access to a global team of stock analysts. By removing the layers of middlemen that typically sit between your money and the markets, we've been able to reduce fees and provide unparalleled transparency in the solution we provide. For more information on what we can do for you, please call 1300 623 863 or contact us through www.nucleuswealth.com.